This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hello everyone, welcome to this service of worship at Centenary United Methodist Church. We're glad that you are here to worship God with us. If you are connecting with us and this is the first way you've connected with us, you've never been to our physical location, we want to give an a special welcome to you. We are glad that you are with us today and part of our worshiping community. If you're a regular part of our church family, we say to you, welcome home. This is a different way, but we're glad that you are worshiping with us today. We are continuing to find uh, new ways and the best ways to con- keep people connected with God and one another. And so next week, as we have mentioned before, we are excited to announce that we are going to resume in-person worship. We will use our traditional service times, that is 901 modern service and 1115 traditional service. We'll have our ASL interpretation at 901. And we invite you to come, and we want you to know that beyond worshiping God, our first priority is your safety. And so with that in mind, uh, we will have seating that makes room for social distancing. We're going to require that you wear a mask. And if you don't have a mask with you when you come, we're going to give you a mask when you get here. We are also going to limit the doors that are entered and we're also going to make sure that at early service you'll be staying just in the CLC building and at the late service you'll be just in the sanctuary building. And those doors you'll enter will be at 901 will be the doors on the lobby of the CLC and at 1115 will be at the narthex doors and the doors by the portico and the chapel. All the other doors including the breezeway and the children's wing will be locked next Sunday. We are continuing to evaluate every week with the interest of our community and your safety paramount in our minds. Now there are some of you who have already shared and many more of you are thinking you might not yet be ready to come back in person. We want you to know that that's okay. That's a decision everyone's going to make. And in fact for some people we recommend that perhaps you worship from home next Sunday. We want you to know that we will have begin live streaming worship services at 9.01 and 11.15 next week. And they'll also be available for viewing after the service as well. And so we invite you to be part of that either in person or live streaming on Facebook. And there will be more communication you'll see in the days to come as we continue to determine what is the best way forward. As we do that, we do continue to be the church at this time. Uh, You should have received a newsletter by email that has things going on in our church family. If you didn't receive that, we'd ask you to email office at danvillecumc.org to uh, be put on that list. There's a lot of things going on uh, on our Facebook page, daily updates from our senior pastor, There's a Wednesday night pastor's Bible study. We do Thursday night prayer meeting by Zoom. Uh, We have activities for children and youth. And so we ask you to continue to be the church of Jesus Christ in this time. We thank you for all the ways you continue to be present and to support our church family, including with your giving of your tithes and offerings. Uh, You can continue to mail offerings to the church office or to give them through our secure online portal. Uh, The link is down in the comments. And so we are glad that you are here today. And now let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Giver of every breath I give, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect to you be the goal, maker of heaven. Jesus. 
Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. This week's scripture comes from the book of John, chapter 14, verse 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me. And I am in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, kids, and those adults among you who act like kids sometimes. This morning, I have a verse of scripture to share with you. It comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, and it goes as follows. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Now, during these uh, unusual times we're in, how many of you remember going to preschool or to school still? Have you ever had the teacher call on you in class or in your preschool or even your mom and dad at home ask you an answer or ask you a question I'm sorry that you didn't know the answer to or that maybe you didn't even know the question because you were daydreaming or not paying attention or or thinking about your new toys or new bicycle or whatever. Has this happened to you? I know that sometimes it even happens to us adults. I mean we'll be at work and start thinking about something at home or something our kids have done or something we want to do instead of being working and and it'll happen to us. When the teachers call on you or your mom and dad call on you, they're, they're trying to help you get ready for a test or for something you need to know, aren't they? They want to know that you have learned a lesson, whether it's a class lesson or a life lesson at home. And they want to know that you're going to do well if you ever need to have that knowledge. Well, Mr. Pat has a test for you today. There's only four questions, so don't worry. So here's the first one. This first question says, what color is this? And you have a choice of orange or purple. Well, I think it's safe to say we all pick purple, right? Okay, question number two. It says, add two birds plus two birds. And the answer is, right, four birds, right? All right, questions get a little bit harder. Here's number three. Is apple juice a solid, a liquid, or a gas? Well, now, we're not going to get into a big science lesson, but we're going to say it's a liquid because we can pour it out of the glass or into the glass, correct? All right, last question, and this is for those of you that are really, really smart. Find the answer to this equation. 
I know you can do it, right? Uh, to be honest, I can't either. It's been a long time since I did that sort of stuff. But, you know, some questions that we get are easy and some are hard. Well, you know, the teachers calling on us for questions or parents asking us questions, it's the same thing with God. God wants you to prepare for a time when he will give you a test. But God's test is not going to be with a paper and pencil or with a computer. God's test is to, for you to answer his call to help someone else when they need it. So how do you get ready for God's test? Well, you get ready by reading your Bible, by going to church and Sunday school, and by practicing the way God wants you to live. If you're kind, other children will want to be around you. They will want to talk with you, and that will give you a chance to tell them about Jesus. Now, in, in these times, you know, we don't get to be around one another as much as we want to, but we can still talk to them from a distance, or if we have talk to them on the phone, we can talk, tell them on the phone, right? Well, will you be ready for when God gives you a test, or will you be distracted and daydreaming or miss out? Maybe God will call on you to be kind to someone in your class when you go back to school or at home or someone you meet and they need a friend. Maybe God will ask you to share your toys when we get to be with other kids, with someone who lives near you, even if you don't really like them. Maybe God will just want you to talk with someone and, and to be friends with them. Whatever it is that God want, calls you to do, you need to be ready. You need to answer that call and be ready for that test. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Help us to be more like you and help us to show others about your love. We love you, God. Amen. Now, I don't want to disappoint, and I know we're not together, but I did have to show you that I have a handful of candy, and I want you to know that Mr. Pat will think about you as he eats it, okay? <laughs> Maybe it won't be long till we can be together again and share some candy amongst us. You all have a good Sunday and a good day and a good week, and we'll be talking to you soon. Bye-bye. is calling Oh come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ
Let us gather our hearts and go to the Lord together now in prayer. O oh Lord, it is good that we are here today. It is good that we have gathered together across time and space to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we come today and we acknowledge that there is only one hope in our life. In these days, we have been reminded that all the things that we put our stock in can change in a moment. All of those things that we thought were immovable and steady suddenly become shaky. But Father, in this time, we come together and we acknowledge that you have not changed, that uh, you are not different, that you have not left us, you have not forsaken us, and that in the midst of this, that you are that thing that is our steady rock and anchor and our one true hope. And so, Father, draw us closer to you in these days. Draw us closer to the good news that Jesus Christ is alive. Draw us closer to that hope that this world and all that we see and the struggle and the trouble and the pandemics and the illnesses are not the end but that there is something beautiful, something for which we can have hope. Father, in these days, we pray for the needs of the world. In our hearts, we think of so many who have been affected. We think of our nation and our leaders. We think of our community. We think of our healthcare workers. We think of our families, our friends, we think of those who are alone and those who are struggling in this time. For those who are grieving loss at this moment, that your peace may come upon them. That your peace that passes all understanding would keep their hearts and minds in the knowledge of you and of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, in these days of uncertainty, continue to surround us with your stable love. Continue to give us hope that there will come a brighter tomorrow. Father, keep us healthy, keep us safe, strengthen us and fill us with your grace in this time and in all the days to come. And so, Father, hear our prayers today as we lift them to you now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 and following. Hear the word of the Lord. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for, what is, for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, 
who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, for you alone are our rock and our mighty redeemer. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. Let's visit again from the middle of verse 14 to the middle of verse 16 of our scripture lesson today. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. We see at the beginning of this short piece from our passage today that there's a tension sometimes between the church and the culture, between our faith and the world that we live in. Reinhold Niebuhr talked about five different ways that church and culture work together. And depending on which way you see church and which way you see culture will depend on how you feel that the church or how you feel that individual Christians should interact with the world at large. First, he says that we might have this idea that Christ is against culture. That is, that everything in culture is bad and terrible and distorted, and everything in Christ is good and holy and full and true, and that these two are diametrically opposed to each other. One must choose culture, or one must choose Christ. The second form of Christ and culture is the Christ of culture. There are people who recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, who believe that he has come to save the best that is in our culture. And so for those who believe that Christ is revealed in culture, that there's the Christ of culture, we take what it is that we love about the world and uh, about the culture that we live in and we baptize them into Christianity. We, we bring them into the faith so that what it is that our culture values then uh, in theory becomes uh, overreigned by God. There is third, Christ above culture. Recognizing that this world is limited in scope, but God's power is unlimited. That this world is fallen, this world is broken, this world is a world that God bestows grace upon. But nonetheless, this world is imperfect and small when compared to the greatness and the goodness of Almighty God. Christ above culture is the third possibility. The fourth is that Christ and culture are in paradise, that there's something going on in the world down here which is never going to be good, it's never going to be perfect, and it's always going to be held paradoxically with what's going on in, in heaven and in the heavenly realm, and that we have obligations toward God, but we also live in a world that is completely fallen and a completely broken place, and, and those two worlds don't necessarily intersect. In other words, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, to be a good employee, to be a good husband or, or father, uh, to, to do our duty on earth, but knowing that, that God and our relationship with God is on a completely different plane. And finally, we have this possibility that Christ is the transformer of culture. 
that God has made this world and God has called this world good. That our culture, that our society, that our learning, that all that we do as, as people who live together in community, all of these things have positive functions. And all that is possible in the history of the world is possible because God holds this world together. And there is a dramatic interaction between God and human beings. And God is in the business of transforming everything from transforming my heart and transforming your heart to transforming your family to transforming this community. God is active in the transformation of culture. We see this as important because of the very first part of this portion that I was just focusing on. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. In Peter's day, there is this tension between culture and faith. There is this reality that sometimes people of faith are going to be dragged into court. That sometimes people of faith in the Roman context are going to be intimidated and asked to explain the faith that they have to other people who are around. There is this tension, in other words, in 1 Peter 3, 14, 15, and 16, this tension between Christ and culture. And I believe that Christ calls us to transform the world through the spirit of God that is within him, within us. God calls us to transform the world because God is in the business of transforming the world. Whatever we do, we do because God is within us, because God has chosen to place us in this society in this culture, in the setting that we are in at the moment. Christ is the transformer of culture, and we have to recognize that we must do the will of the Lord. We can fear those who are opposed to us, or we can fear God. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. And so in 1 Peter, we get this recognition that there is a difference between Christ and culture, but that Christ comes into the world to transform us and to transform the world. Listen to the next passage here. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. In Peter's day, this may well have taken place in a court of law when those who were Christians were dragged into court for not participating in things that every citizen was expected to participate in. There were people who might have been dragged into court uh, for no longer worshiping idols or not going to the meat market that they had gone to previously. But there's a broader sense in which there are mystery religions in the ancient world. And you didn't know what happened in the hallowed halls of the mystery religions unless you were initiated, unless you had been indoctrinated. Peter says Christianity is not one of those secretive religions. Christianity is a faith to be shared. Christianity is a faith where men and women can share the hope and the reason for the hope that is within them Clearly, there are no secrets. We believe that the Messiah has come and that changes everything. I find a lot of Christians have a great deal of difficulty uh, sharing their faith with others. We often think there's some kind of magic words that we need to use. And if we don't do it just right, something about somebody else's relationship with God will be broken. But in fact, the gospel is actually simple enough that a child can understand it. Although the greatest philosopher of all time could continue to revel in its mysteries. The gospel is simple enough that every one of us ought to be able to give an account for the hope that we have. 
We need to be prepared. Prepared to show others the reason for our hope. Sun Tzu, in The Art of War, that famous 6th century um, work, says that every battle is won or lost before it is fought. Every battle is won or lost before it is fought. Roald Amundsen was the famous explorer who in 1911 became the first person to lead a successful expedition to the South Pole. But even though he did this in 1911, he began preparing in 1899. In 1899, he traveled from Norway to Spain for a two-month sailing trip to earn a master's certificate. And then he had a 2,000-mile journey. How did he make the journey? Not by carriage or by horse or ship or by train. He did it on a bicycle so that he could begin to prepare himself physically. He then experimented on eating raw dolphin meat to determine its usefulness as an energy supply. He thought to himself, one day I might be shipwrecked and I might find myself surrounded by dolphins, so I might as well know if I can eat one. It was all part of years of building foundation for his quest that Amundsen went and and apprenticed with Eskimos. What better way to learn how to live in polar conditions than to study with the Eskimos? He learned many things from them. How they used dogs to pull sleds. He learned how they never hurried but moved deliberately and steadily so they would not work up on a sweat which could then be frozen. He learned how their clothes fit loosely so their sweat could evaporate and it protected them from the elements. He systematically practiced Eskimo methods and trained himself for every conceivable situation he might encounter on the way to the South Pole. His philosophy was this, You don't wait until an unexpected storm to recognize that you need to prepare your strength and endurance. You don't wait until you're shipwrecked to find out if you can eat raw dolphin. You don't wait until you're on the Antarctic journey to become a superb skier and dog handler. You prepare with intensity all the time so that when conditions turn against you, you can draw from that deep reservoir of knowledge and strength that has come to you through years of preparation. And you prepare so that whenever conditions are favorable, you can strike and strike hard. Always be prepared. Be ready to give your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Dear Christians, we need to be comfortable sharing. We need to be comfortable sharing the hope that is within us. We need to always be ready. Now there are some people who believe that being always ready is is, uh, carried out in a way that I would consider to be obnoxious. Walking up to a stranger in the park and saying, Did you know that you're going to hell? You might have been on a college campus when street preachers came by who hurled insults at those who passed. I'm not convinced in any way that that is an effective way of sharing the gospel. But I believe that when we have a conversation, if we have prayed that God would open the door to us to have a conversation about real things, we need to always be prepared to share why it is we have this hope. Really, there are only three parts to this. The first is that the world is broken. You know this because you know that you yourself in some way are are broken. If you've watched the news or you have read the newspaper or gotten on the internet recently, you know that the world is broken. Some of that brokenness comes from nature and some of that brokenness comes from the fact that men and women have made choices they ought not have made. We need to recognize first that there's a brokenness in the world and that we share and we drink from that well of brokenness. 
The second thing we need to realize as we're sharing the story of what God is doing in our life is that God loves the world. If you know one verse in the Bible, you know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God's intention for us is for us to live abundant lives. God's intention for us is for us to be men and women who reflect the character of Jesus Christ. God's intentions for us are good. So number one, we we live in this broken world. Number two, we recognize that God loves us and God loves the world. Now you Democrats, God loves people who voted in a way that you didn't vote. Now you Republicans... God loves people who are on the left also. Now, those of you who think that you are superior to other people, God loves the people that you think you're superior to just as much as God loves you. God loves the world. And there is no person who dies in the brush of Africa of thirst that God does not know the number of hairs on their head. There is no person who dies on the street in San Francisco that God doesn't love just as much as he loves me or you. There is no human being in this population of 7 billion plus that God does not love. We are in a broken world. God loves this world. And and God has done what is necessary to bridge the gap between himself and this broken planet. God has in Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, God has brought atonement. And if you think about the word atonement, at one meant, bringing things that are apart together again. God has done what is necessary to bring us life and life abundantly. God has said yes to us even before we've had the chance to turn and Say yes to God. God loves you. If we are to always be prepared to give an account for this hope that we have, we have to recognize and be able to express, yes, the world is broken. I'm a part of that brokenness, and you are too. But God loves us and wants the best for us and invites us to turn from our brokenness and let God begin to do his work within us. And God will bring us to fullness of life. Ask God to give you a chance to share your story, the reason for your hope. Ask God in the midst of a conversation you may be having with family or friends by phone or on Zoom or one-to-one or however that is, ask God to give you a chance to share your story. Because God has worked in your life and is working in your life God may be working in your life on overtime now as you find yourself dealing with the repercussions of what we're currently going through. Always be prepared. Always be prepared to give a reason for this hope that you have. And finally, as we look at those couple of sentences from 1 Peter chapter 3, I love that it reminds us how we are to give this reason for hope. Do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear. So when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. As we share our faith with others, we do so in gentleness and reverence. We recognize that a very core reality that that we are no better than those with whom we share God's good news. We might be further along the path to faith, but we are no more loved. We are no better than anyone with whom we might share the good news of Jesus. And so I invite you today I invite you today to recognize, number one, we are accountable to Jesus Christ. 
we are called, number two, to always give an accounting for this hope that we have. But three, we are called to do so in gentleness, in reverence, in humility, in love. Think about your story today, what God has brought you through. You're probably in the middle. It's probably not like an A and, and B. It's, it's somewhere in between. But think about what God has done in your life and how, when given the opportunity, you can share that with others. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's a place where mercy runs and never dies. There's a
Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing. To the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, power, authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen and amen.